Hi, everybody. Welcome today to our new episode with our talk with uh, Dr. Sam Vaknin. And uh, we introduced him uh, in the previous episode. He's a psychologist and academic, and he studies narcissism. And he was the first one to actually um, explain uh, the term um, narcissistic abuse. Thank you for doing that, because it's a very specific type of abuse that is not as every every other type and uh, today specifically uh, predominant in our society at any level. And today we're gonna talk about uh, the effect of narcissism on the workplace. So the effect of having narcissistic people, not only as leaders and bosses in the workplace, but also uh, as enablers uh, in this um, hierarchy at the bottom uh, of the workplace as much as at the top. So what do you think about that? What do you want to tell us about that? Workplaces in, in Western civilization, at least, because not everywhere. In many countries, workplaces are arranged as networks where everyone is equal. Everyone is a node, a node in the network. So there's no hierarchy. So but, where is, when is the hierarchy then? Hierarchy is typical to the West. It's a Western invention. It's, a, it's part of Western civilization and it's because the West essentially organized itself around industry. And in at the beginning, industry manufacturing required hierarchy. Other countries were more focused on crafts, uh, for example. And crafts is a network approach. The craftsman interacts with his suppliers and with his clients on an equal basis. And the craftsman creates handmade products. So handmade products are much more personal, much more intimate. In other words, in countries that are not within Western civilization, the emphasis was on intimacy, the intimacy of production. Production, production relations and, and values were intimate. But in the West, everything became impersonal. The workers became like in Charlie Chaplin's famous movie, Modern Times. The workers were units of production. Even Marx, even Marx is describing workers as means of production. So, mm -hmm. So we became impersonal, impersonal numbers. We, it's a death count, as I said in, in our previous conversation. So we became objects. And so in the workplace in the West, uh, it's very difficult not to come across narcissistic dynamics because the workplace objectifies you. There's a hierarchy which is very tempting because if there's a hierarchy it means I have power over you. And it's very tempting to use this power and to abuse this power because power is gratifying. Power is, power is dopamine. Power is addictive. And the more I use my power, the more I abuse you and so on, the more gratified I am. It's like a drug addiction. You can't get enough of it. Western, exactly. Western workplaces encourage you to abuse power, not to use power, to abuse power and encourage you to, to, feel as a, to feel like an object. And so this creates this impersonality, removal of the personal, removal of the intimate, creates an incentive for both overt narcissists and covert narcissists. The overt narcissist wants to abuse the power because it's a high, it's like a drug high, it's a trip. If I abuse you with my power, I feel grandiose, I feel great, I feel elevated and superior to you, I feel godlike, it gives me godlike power. So the more I abuse you with my unlimited power as your boss, for example, the more I feel godlike, and the more I am unable to resist the urge to abuse you again. And at the lower level, co-workers, even subordinates, you have people who are covert narcissists and therefore they're passive aggressive. The Western civilization is constructed around bureaucracies. Even big, even private companies, they are bureaucracies. And bureaucracy is essentially a set of rules and procedures, which is a field day for covert narcissists because covert narcissists leverage rules and procedures to sabotage you, to undermine you, to torture you, to hold you back, to destroy you, to they are doing everything right by the book. Everything Absolutely. Is it's, it's not by chance. 
It's not by chance that many narcissists are, in fact, lawyers, for example, because yeah. they know that within the law, they can actually move and be safe, that they're not doing anything wrong, but they can have fun because they are very sadistic people in the end. So, but at the same time, how do you, because um, this is one of the topics I, I deal with uh, in my page, for example, uh, how do you feel like, um, you know, I would like you to explain you know, it's better if you explain it, how um, on the workplace, these dynamics keep being perpetuated despite they're abusive, they're toxic. They don't go to for the good of anyone, especially the company, because in the end, these people don't allow good people with good intentions to move forward. So what we have is that these people in their own small world are just getting gratification by being sadistic, but then the system is losing because of that. Good people are losing because of that. Why do you think uh, it's still perpetuated? These things still happen. There is a problem in economics. It's known as the agent principle problem. The agent principle problem simply means that the workers inside a system, an organization, a corporation, do not act. Uh, in favor uh, of the corporation. They act in their own favor. So managers, managers, for example, will steal the money of the company by giving themselves inflated wages, inflated salaries. So the agents, managers, workers, co-workers, colleagues, suppliers, the, the agents in, in the company will act against the best interests of the company and the shareholders. That is called the agent principle, uh, principle problem in economics. So the best interests are not only economic. That is the big discovery of behavioral economics. Daniel Kahneman, Tversky, other, other big economists, important economists discovered that people, when they, when they use economic decision-making, they're only partly rational. They are not fully rational. They are partly yeah. irrational, yes? And so uh, when, when you seek gratification within a bureaucracy, within an organization, within a company or corporation, within any structure, within any institution, when you seek gratification, it is only partly financial gratification. It's also emotional gratification. It's also irrational gratification. And sometimes, very often, Kahneman demonstrated it and received the Nobel Prize for this. Very often, you would sacrifice money, efficiency, productivity, products, just to feel emotionally gratified. For example, to act impulsively, recklessly, callously, ruthlessly, you would give up a lot. So narcissistic managers, they don't mind if the company goes to hell, if the productivity collapses, if the workers hate them. They need the gratification of torturing you, tormenting you, abusing you, because it makes them feel like gods. Co-workers would undermine you and sabotage you passive aggressively because they need to. It is an impulse. It's emotional. And yes, maybe because of that, they will not be promoted and they will not give us get a salary raise, or maybe they will be fired. They will be fired, but they will still do it. That's the big discovery of bounded rationality. Bounded rationality in economics. Crazy. But don't you think at this point, because most times, so in one of my videos, I, just, I say that, uh, yes, maybe um, for some reason, having this kind of narcissistic people go somewhat uh, towards the goals of the corporation, especially at the beginning, because these are people that don't have any morals, they don't have to compromise with their values, they don't care. So they do whatever it's asked of them. And so sometimes good people will not do that. So at the beginning of the stages, you know, about whatever company and the country also, whatever, whatever uh, level of the hierarchy, uh, we have that these kind of behaviors, predatory behaviors, are good for success because they allow you to conquer a lot. But after a while, every system, as you're saying, that allows these kind of people to stay on top, to keep their position, to, you know, perpetuate these kind of behaviors, 
will collapse because these people don't go, don't do the interest of the system they're in. So don't you think that corporations as well as nations are at any hierarchical level? Don't you think that this kind of behavior should be somewhat uh, eliminated or put, keep, kept under control and that instead good people should be recognized as leaders because they have the best interest of everybody in mind? Well, scholars like Maccoby, Maccoby and Kevin Dutton and Babiak the collaborator of Robert Hare. These scholars have studied the issue of psychopathy, psychopaths and narcissists in corporations, in companies, in the business world. And it's very right what you're saying. Uh, business leaders, chief executive officers, for example, who are psychopaths and narcissists, obtain better, more beneficial outcomes in the short time, in the short range, in the short term. But in the medium to long term, they destroy their companies. Yeah. Same in politics, Donald Trump, for example, yes? Yeah. Or Bolsonaro in Brazil, same, Duterte, I mean, Putin. So uh, short term, it is the dazzle and the spectacle of the short term. One of the main reasons, in West, one of the main problems in Western civilization, we, we, came, we, we became short termists. We think only short term. 150 characters in Twitter, the bottom line in the financial statements. We want to think maximum what will happen in the next five minutes or three months if we have very long view. You're so right. You're so, so right. And so in short term, narcissists and psychopaths have a dis an advantage. They are really far better in the short term. And because we're all focused on the short term, the sound bite. So we think that narcissists and psychopaths are excellent, wonderful, amazing leaders. And, and so we, we fall in this trap. In the long term, of course, they are invariably destructive to themselves, to everyone around them, to any system or institution or company they're in, utterly, unmitigatedly dis, dis, destructive. But even in academe, we have a contagion. We have a virus spreading. We have mm -hmm. scholars who are writing about a functioning narcissist, how wonderful narcissists are. We have scholars in prime universities suggesting that we should put psychopaths and narcissists in positions of leadership and authority. We have this in academia now, the infection. Narcissism Crazy. is bon ton now. It's considered to be an, a competitive advantage. In July 2016, the magazine New Scientist came with a cover story Parents, teach your children to be narcissists. Well, in a narcissistic world, only either you are a narcissist or you just fail. The problem is that what people don't understand, as you're saying, is that you may not want to think next to what happens after five minutes, but those five minutes are going to end and you're going to be on the sixth and then you're going to have to face it. That's a problem that people don't understand. And that's why we have today, for example, Greta Thunberg and all these new generation kids uh, trying to fight for their own survival because they figure that people of the past generations only think about the next five minutes and they don't think about the future of the planet. But the future of the planet is, you know, you in our life is becoming so much longer today that you are going to be here. Everybody's going to be here in 60 years. And you're going to have to face the result of what you built. So, yeah, this is just craziness. The idea that narcissistic people have to go in power because it just leads to destruction of everything. Because, like, what I think is that not only, uh, you know, these hierarchical, um, you know, people in power in different hierarchies at different levels, uh, because they all act without coordinating with each other, but just because they're narcissistic, they all act in the same exact way. In the end, the world is just the sum of their behaviors. They don't have to coordinate. You don't need a conspiration okay. to actually lead the world towards something bad. You just have to have people that for some reason act like softwares, all in the same direction, like matrix, you know, like the sentinels. They all act in the same way, so the system starts moving in that exact direction. So how would you uh, deal with that? Because 
we need to make people understand, or at least this is my feeling, because I know unless, you know, something happens, I, I know I'm going to be here in a while, right? So I want to make sure that people understand that we need to invest in our future as well, because we're going to be there and we're going to need help as well. So how would, what would you suggest, not only to people at the bottom level, but also to leaders and to institutions, what would you suggest? Uh, to deal with it and instead have a way to not have narcissistic leaders, to not have a system that is destined to collapse, but to have a system that is sustainable. First of all, the concept of future is dead. People of people of voting, people of voting with their actions in a way that makes clear that they don't believe in any future. For example, marriage, marriage rate has declined by 70% in the West. Dating, dating has declined by 56% in a single decade. People don't date anymore. The predominant sexual practice today is hookups, one night stands. People clearly do not believe that there is any future. They, one third of people live with their parents beyond the age of 35. So there's no future. So you believe yeah. that the point is that we all became like sick heads, like we just live for the moment and yes. that's it. Carpe, carpe diem. And you see it in psychology as well, because in psychology, we transitioned from time oriented therapies like psychoanalysis to present oriented therapies like mindfulness. Oh, yeah. Today, most of our therapies, gestalt, mindfulness, they are present-oriented, this minute. Forget the past, forget the future. Focus on now, the here and now, your body, your mind, here and now. It is an eternal present. And of course, consequently, we are all eternal children because you can grow up only in time. And when there's no time, there's no growth. There's no development. And so we gave up on time. We gave up on time. Now, the only solution to narcissism and psychopathy in corporations and in institutions and is to give up on the antiquated concept of hierarchy, to transition from hierarchy to network. Because the network organizational principle has numerous advantages. First of all, it corresponds well with technology, but it also regulates relationships between people in a way that prevents the dominance of any single individual. The network balances itself, corrects itself. The internet, for example, is a wonderful example because the internet is a totally random network. This Zoom conference that we're having right now, it's random. We are sending our information randomly over randomly assembled and reassembled networks all the time. No one can interrupt us. No one can cut us off. Never mind how much you try. The United States government cannot cut you and me off. No one can. Why? Because we are using a network. No one can be dominant in a network. No one can corrupt a network. No one can affect a network. No one can compromise a network. It's not a hierarchy. This is the only organizational principle that can counter the undue influence of narcissists and psychopaths. We transition to networks, we're safe. Even in the internet, the internet has no board of directors, no chief executive officer, nothing. And it functions perfectly, perfectly. Same with Wikipedia. We need to crowdsource power instead of concentrating it or allocating it. We need to move from committee to multitude and networks. And this is a, philo a philosophical psychological transition that is not easy because all everything is constructed around hierarchy. We have one president of the United States, but, yes. in, Swiss but in Switzerland, the president changes every year. Yeah. So it's a network approach in Switzerland. And, uh, and who, going there, yeah. And who, 
who is the most stable country politically? United States or Switzerland? Switzerland. Yeah, definitely. definitely. I agree totally agree with you on this sense, because it is true that uh, the only way to do that is actually uh, going towards an actor. I feel like today a lot of, uh, especially tech companies, which are, you know, the newest generation companies are more uh, focused on that kind of this sort of setting. Not all of them, but a lot of startups tend to facilitate this sort of structure where the person in power, also the dress code, you know, uh, for example, in Facebook, uh, people tend to dress normally. So it's difficult to identify, you know, this status symbol of a manager is not there anymore. They destroyed it. They somewhat, you know, you are identified by your skills, by whatever you do, but you're not, you know, better in terms of hierarchy you are for sure but not visibly so that already i feel like is a good uh, step forward so maybe we are moving there we're moving towards a world where people understood uh, how much narcissistic behaviors and you know a hierarchy that allows these kind of behaviors is in fact detrimental to the system and to the world so uh, hopefully um, our, uh, also our audience will agree with us and they will start requesting this sort of uh, network-like uh, jobs instead of having a hierarchy because they will understand the benefit of it. And I think for today, um, we had a very great chat and we can go to the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.